Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight Eric Hansen and Paul Simon are back, and we are looking at the band Extreme. So uh, let's get started. Talking bands no one talks about. Grant's Rock Warehouse. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome Eric Hansen and Paul Simon here to the show. Tonight, can you believe this? We're going to talk about the band Extreme. Now, who in the world is talking Extreme? Not many people. A lot of people really don't really pay much attention. You know, you've got Gary Sharon, who was brought in from Extreme to be the lead vocalist of Van Halen for one record, Van Halen 3, one record. And, well, that was a failure. And that was Gary Sharon. And Nuno Benincourt is one of those guitar players, absolutely brilliant, who back in the day, you know, in the mid-80s to the early... Uh, well, I guess in the early 90s was thought highly, I would say. Um, but really, no one's talking about this band anymore. Um, so these gentlemen here are extreme aficionados. I, I like to use that term. I don't really use that. But you two gentlemen are extreme aficionados. And we're going to talk about those first four albums. So what we've got, we've got, uh, let me get my list so I know I don't screw it up. Extreme from 1989. Extreme Tune for Pornography, which was, that was the album that brought them into the forefront. That's in 1990. So that's pretty late. It's still a little bit uh, before grunge. So, you know, uh, Extreme 3, Sides to Every Story from 1992, which we're in the grunge era now, and Waiting for the Punchline in 1995. They put out uh, two additional records, uh, one in 2008 and another album in 20. Well, I just put one out in 2023. Six. Yes. There you go. But anyway, we're just going to look at those AM records, those first four records. So, gentlemen, nice to see you. How are you? These guys were here before. Everyone's seen these guys, but how is everybody? You guys doing good? Doing good. Doing Ready good. to talk some extreme? Absolutely. Now, I don't know who yeah. wants to start out, but I, I figure what we're going to do, we're just going to do like a general overview. We'll go an hour. Um, talk about the records, talk about the tracks you like, give them a rating, you know, cause the idea in Grant's rock warehouse, everybody watches this. We're trying to turn you on to these bands that no one talks about. And I figure after all these years and these gentlemen feel after all these years of extreme people should really give these guys another look because they were pretty much on another level. They weren't your typical I don't want even want to put them in hair metal because I don't think they were even in that genre. Um, I, pr I think probably people put them in there because of the time period. And the look of the first album. We'll, we'll talk look, about Yeah, But we'll these guys, that. yeah, we'll talk about it. But I don't look at these guys that way. So anyway, let's uh, go ahead and just look at that first album, Extreme from 1989. Uh, producer on this was Mac. So yeah. if anybody knows Mac, there you go. There's the props. Mac produced a lot of stuff with Billy Squire, and yeah. in the uh, and Queen during the album The Game, he produced a whole stretch of most of that '80s stuff with Queen. So you know he's kind of a big deal. He's proved his worth. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the backstory is and how they got Mac, but anyway, they got him for this 1989 album. And the, the, this album, yeah, it sold pretty well for a debut. I think, what, what 300,000 copies or something? I mean, it didn't set the world on fire. Met with mixed reviews. Uh, let's look. All Music gave it three stars. Martin Popoff, Collector's Guide to Heavy Metal, he gave it a six out of ten. Rolling Stone, which hates everything, as we all know, gave it a three. I mean, that's just average. We're going to throw it over to the panel. I'm going to start out with Eric tonight and uh, get his thoughts on this first record and his rating on it. Then we'll throw it over to Paul. So, Eric, welcome to the show. And like I said, let's just keep it loose and just talk about the album. And we don't have to go too in depth. Uh, anyway, Eric, nice to see you. Go ahead. Good seeing you guys, his thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, 1989. And you, you started off uh, well there, Grant. These guys were a little different than some of the bands that came out around that time because they combined hard rock, uh, pop, funk, a little jazz. So they, and not a lot of bands were doing that. You know, the ones that off the top of my head, 1990, uh, there's a band called Talisman, which was Jeff Scott Soto and Marcel Jacob, who were on the first two Inbate Malmsteen records. 
all their stuff was released in in uh, Japan and overseas. We knew nothing about it here in the states. Uh, Living Color, a little bit. Faith No More. Um, that, you know, those are maybe some of the ones that kind of like dived in a little bit to the um, funk stuff. But um, mm-hmm. this record here, Humble Beginnings, for like I said, a unique band. Nuno Betancourt, ah, man, good player. I, I don't remember. It was it was either my brother or a friend they had the tape for this like eric you got you got to hear the intro to mother don't want to go to school and the the guitar solo and i'm just like who in the world is this guy Mm -hmm. and had to go out and get the tape and uh you know very technically sound you know he's up there but the guy's also got a lot of charisma with his playing yeah especially live i mean i've seen them personally twice paul i think you've probably seen him a little bit more than i have but Okay, yeah, I, the guy could pull it off live. Um, Gary Sharon, you know, you mentioned him about you know eventually being Van Halen singer, mm-hmm. and and folks, he was not the issue with that Van Halen album. It wasn't Gary's voice; it was just the songs. That's a different subject for a different time. That's but, a different show, but yeah. we can't blame <laughs> Gary for no, 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 no. Gary had a, a great vocal style for this type of uh, um, sound that they were going for. Um, <sighs> Lyrically, this is going to be a theme. Lyrically on this album, outside of a couple of songs, a little um, typical of the time, 1989, you know, they're talking about girls and love and sex. Mm-hmm. However, there are two tracks on here that kind of is a precursor of what is to come. One of them is, in my opinion, is Kid Ego, which the song is kind of self-explanatory. It's about keeping your ego in check. And the other one is Watching Waiting, which is about Good Friday. And going forward, Gary Sharon uh, incorporated a lot of his spiritual and uh, beliefs. You know, he's never been a really outspoken Christian. However, a lot of his lyrics really are down that route. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, if you want to add anything to that. You know, too, because uh, we'll get to three sides, but uh, I believe Portuguese, the Our Father, uh, in that interim Yep. Am I ever going to change? So that was his touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as Extreme One goes, I actually got a couple of dates to throw out there. Came out very early in 1989. And I want to note that Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure came out in February of 1989. Yeah. And that's going to be important because Play With Me was on the soundtrack. And we can't, Eric and I can't have been the only ones, but we were working at a theater, at a movie theater together. Yeah. And that was the scene that we usually would take our break on, cut in and watch. <laughs> uh, one of the things it's one of the ways we became friends at age 16 mm-hmm. so uh so that's what got us like that's what got me into them mm-hmm. so by the time and we'll get to pornography but as far as buying the first album the ones that jumped out at me uh yeah the the image i think is where they got the hair metal tag from because if you watch the earliest video for mother it, it wow wow and oh, look, look at, the at that album cover though i mean it airspray Hair bands, they actually look like Kiss Without Makeup in that first video for Mother, seriously. And walking with the crowd, to the camera, and all that stuff. a lot of damn hair, a lot of hair, uh, what do you call those things? Hair uh, things. What was the the popular hairspray back then? uh, Oh, oh, Aquanet. 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 (laughs) They single-handedly took out the ozone in Boston, but no. Um, So, no, yeah, the singles were the three you mentioned, and they came out pretty sequentially. It was Play With Me, came out in February of 89. Little Girls was released. No, pardon me, Kid Ego was, oh, there were four singles. I'm wrong. Play With Me was uh, February. Uh, uh, Kid Ego was March. Little Girls was July. And by then, Bill and Ted's was out and starting to pick up some steam, so they're shooting singles out now. And then Mother came out as a single in uh, September of 89. Now, that being said, Eric touched on all the finer points. The couple things I want to add on the album. Mm-hmm. Um, if you listen to songs like Rock a Bye Bye, that does not fit the mold as well. You mentioned watching Waiting I was all set to say it's the exact same thing, which is I finally saw a live version of that on YouTube. I've been, I was praying every time. I'm, okay. I'm Wrong choice. Not. I was really hoping that they were going to play that at some point when I saw them live. I never saw them do it live. I, I did find a live version. As good as I expect it to be. But Rocket Bye Bye, you're you're talking, listen to the harmonies, listen to the backgrounds. Like you hear all the stuff. I would liken it to when like a Rush fan, for example, listens to Caress of Steel 
and you can hear the elements that are there. You can hear the three-part harmony, but it's not as high up in the mix yet. You know, Bob St. John had yet to start working his magic, and I'll get to praising him a lot in a bit. But you've got the three-part harmonies, and Paul actually adds vocals too, so they could do four, depending on the song. Yeah. You've got Gary's vocals, obviously Nuno, but I think the secret sauce, especially with their album sound, and it translates perfectly live, is their rhythm section oh, between yeah. Badger and Paul Geary. Yeah. Just for the history, really quick, that's how they got the name Extreme, was Paul Geary and Gary Sharon were in a band called The Dream, and so they were X-Dream, there's Extreme. Pat was in a band called In the Pink, and Nuno was a band called Sinful, and then they got together as a band. There's a good history. But point is, when you got Pat and Paul playing together, they've got a sound. It's like just this chunky, awesome low end. And the first album, it's not as high lit. It, that's something I noticed. I'm re-listening for this. It is, it, it's not as high lit. It's not as featured. But by the time we get to Pornography, it's going to be off the charts nailed that's that's their secret weapon now it's not like they're isolated as a unit these four work unbelievably well yes. that you take any two and they're going to be in sync they're going to be doing you, stuff together yeah you're mentioning about the vocal harmonies that's 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 big these guys man and all four of them can sing yeah it'll feature prominently in later albums yes. but you yes. can see the beginnings in this so mm -hmm. image wise they were doing what they had to at the time, I believe. Yes. And then the minute they got the pornography, that's going to get kicked and they're going to become who they are. And we're going to see it as far as themes. That's the last thing I want to touch on and we'll move on. Um, all four of these actually have a theme. It's maturation going upwards. Yep. So extreme one is childhood. childhood. So stay tuned. Okay, cool. So what would you guys rate this record? I mean, debut album i mean they're not fully realized at this point you know don't base everything on the photo you see on the album cover what would you uh i don't know what would your rating out of 10 be out of 10 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i would give it a, you got it. You got i it? would give it a strong 7.5 okay fair yes. enough Play yes. Simon? yeah yeah well, seven from me all the elements are there. They just, childhood. They don't know how to use them yet. It's a fun record. It's it's fun. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it, well, there's, there's, you know, a lot of these bands. Oh yeah. Uh, they there's, start off on their first album. It's fully realized. Yes. And you know they never can achieve that greatness again. I'm not saying seven like it's a bad thing. I'm no, saying no, they need no. To but you know, what I mean, this is the band that improved over time. Yep. Yeah. Is what I'm trying well, to say. Yeah, songs that stand up right now on their own. Put them on, listen to them, and nail it. Kid Ego, Watching, Waiting. Mother, still, it's because it's you got the early funk right there. Rock a Bye Bye, definitely. Play With Me, even Flesh and Blood. These songs stand yeah. up. Teachers, and I'm not on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. A strong, a 7 and a 7.5. I don't, that's fine for a debut. I don't, yeah. especially with a band like this, which... You know they, they they've morphed they've improved in a, a, a very fast rate because we're talking extreme and then extreme two just a year and it's like leaps and bounds. So anyway, all right, we have a seven seven point five. Let's look at that second album, extreme two, the second A and M record. Right. Um, this this record sold really well. It all took off right here um got to number 10 on the top the billboard 200 went double platinum here in the states um two singles more than words and wholehearted um i believe both well more than words was one of those songs in 1990 you could not escape which was a ballad it reached number one on the charts and the other album wholehearted i think got to number four um Things really came together on this record. Uh, I don't know. Let's throw it over to uh, Eric. What's your thoughts? Yeah, this. so this was um, produced by Michael Wagner and Nuno. Michael Wagner did uh, stuff with Accept. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Michael Wagner, yeah, Dokken. Yeah. Striper, King's X. Yeah, so he's, yeah. Um, I read an article <clears throat> with, uh, or an interview, I should say, with Gary Sharon. Because this has often been compared to like a 
concept record. And when it's funny, what when they were touring with this before this was released, they were writing songs for this. And um, Gary, Gary, um, th- this is more of a coming of age tale. And a lot had to do with what he was experiencing. I mean, it's about an innocent boy growing up and learning about sex, drugs, rock and roll and in a decadent society. And um, bumped up fairy tale. So, and it's, it's weird because lyrically this, this still holds up and maybe even more relevant now than when it was first released. But mm-hmm. so as far as a, a concept, um, I, I wouldn't put this, the band, when the band was writing and, and helping out, they, they wanted to link everything thematically, but I wouldn't put this to like Operation Mind Crime or Dark Side of the Moon. I, w- I wouldn't go. There's there. a universal holding theme, yes. binding theme to yes. it, but it's not right. a story. Yeah. But the band, the band came into their own on this record. It's diverse. It's got hard rock. It's got funk. Torch. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Torch. Yeah. <laughs> well, since it's got all these different styles, do you think that it holds together as an album really well? Because, you know, if you have a lot of these records that they have all these different styles, you know, heavy metal, blues, funk, blah, blah, blah. It's all over the map. You think it works on this record? I mean, the reviews on this record. Well, Martin Popoff, for one, likes this record a lot better than the other one. He gave a nine out of ten out of it. And for the most part, all music gave it four out of five. Daily Vault gave it a B minus. Hey, looks good on paper. Uh, I don't know. You think those reviews are adequate? I mean, do you think that's are they right in the right ballpark? Martin Popoff a nine out of ten, ladies and gentlemen. That's pretty good. Yeah, and and what what took this album to another level is the song "More Than Words," which there have been how many stories? I'm sure both of you have read like people walking into the record. Hey, do you have the band that sings that song "More Than Words"? They bring this record home and they realize there's like driving hard rock on. What they're going, what the hell is this? Can I return this? <laughs> yeah. Because it does sound very well. It, it's, it's not funk. at its heart. It's funk yes. rock. It is. Right. This is a punk rock album. Mm-hmm. Yes, and ly- lyrically, they took this thing to they they took the whole album to a to a different level. Mm-hmm. Where this one, like I, like I mentioned, you saw a little bit of signs. We're 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 in we're in the pool swimming now, folks. With with this, so uh, and more than words. And Paul, you may want to touch on this. It's not one right. what he thinks the song is about. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, the other and the other song that that uh, helped this one was wholehearted, and um, wholehearted is um, that that's a song that's basically about again this is Gary coming out and saying you know I, I need that whole I, I got that again the theme of the album but he's got that hole in his heart and he's reaching mm-hmm. out to God I need I need uh, you to fill it for me and that's what the song is about more than words. I'll, I'll let Paul. <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to you, Paul. All right, Paul. What's more than words about? Is this what is it? You're rubbing your hands talking. together. I need you to show me how you feel. It's put up or shut up. Put out or shut oh, up. Put out or this shut is up. Not a romantic song. No. <laughs> this yeah. is remember, okay. The theme of this one is lost innocence. It's adolescence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, a bunked up fairy tale is the tagline. I didn't come up with that on my own. It's on the back of the album. So, or the front, depending on which version you got. Well, it's kind of like, uh, it's like the 1990 version of Beach Boys Pet Sounds, which that whole record's all about young love and relationships yeah. Oh, yeah. and feelings and emotions. This is kind of like a 1990 version of it. Absolutely, you know, they yeah. sound totally different, you know, but I mean, that whole concept. No, you're right. You're absolutely because right. Because they always talk about Pet Sounds being a, a loose concept about young love. Yeah. Same here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so released August seventh, nineteen ninety. Oh, Eric's gonna rate it. So, I'm sorry. Well, that's right. Go ahead, and we'll go back and rate it. You can we'll go, go back ahead. and rate it. I'll take it. Take it. So, August seventh, nineteen ninety. Pornography comes out. First single. Uh, I couldn't get an exact month, but it's the first single. It's the early single. Uh, is Decadence Dance. Mm-hmm. Eh. It's met. Eh. Video is. You see about my twenty fifth anniversary T shirt back there. It's got all the characters incorporated from the album art. So. Does its thing. 
Second singles get the funk out, 1991, early in early, like probably January 1991. Um, the it, it gets a video, even though it didn't come out as a not to my knowledge, it didn't come out as a vinyl single. Um, it didn't chart. Um, but it was an AOR rotation at that point, and it was on Headbangers Ball and all that. So uh then and bars started picking up on it and playing it at uh at 2 a.m. to get people out of their places. Then more than words hit March twenty third, nineteen ninety one. You know what's so, funny? Yeah, I don't want to interrupt, but I have to make a comment. Yeah, and it, don't you think it's funny? Maybe it was the time period. Maybe it's the way the record company looked at the band. But wouldn't you think that more than words would have been the lead off single with this? No. You don't think? Why? why? Go ahead. Here's why. Eric and I, when doing our little deep dive and research, going and all that, found them performing that before the album came out on a Toronto uh, interview, uh, almost like a Phil Donahue type show, yeah, talking about yeah. like that. Very strange. Yeah. Um, so they were pushing that, but the idea, I believe, was the first, the, think about the first lead singles you got there, Decadence Dance to Get the Funk mm -hmm. Out, or very much how the album actually sounds. More than words sonically and wholehearted, outside of Song for Love and When I First Kissed You, it sounds like the rest of the album yeah. outside of those two tracks. So when those didn't hit, then it's okay. Now it's time for more than words. Now it's the, this is their sister Christian Grant. We've had this conversation. Same, same yeah. idea. Different. Song. I didn't I, think about that, but you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. Because now they're the more than words guys, which be careful what you wish for. And I'm not, I've got an opinion, but it's just that an opinion. I'm not saying I'm right. I don't know if it, do you think it's after all these years, you think they're still pigeonholed like that? By who is the question? All right. right? Majority of rock fans, absolutely not. Right. Okay. People who follow pop music, absolutely yes. And I think they're fine with it. They shed that because there's a story I love. I can't remember what year, but they're, uh, either doing a show with it. I think they were doing a show with Aerosmith. It wasn't a tour. It was just a, a show in Boston, I believe. Um, and the comments tell me if I'm wrong about the location. But uh, it was the equivalent of, and I, I'm not going to get the details right, so I'm not going to bother. It's okay. It's all right. They didn't want to. They were getting a little bit tired of playing more than words of people screaming for more than words and all of that. And Aerosmith had learned from Dream On don't want to demonetize you, but they someone had, someone from Aerosmith had spray painted in big letters, play the effing song in their dressing room. In other words, give the people what they want, and that kind of turned them. I saw an interview. I'm not sure if it was it was Nuno, so I'm not sure if it was Bad or who it was, but he was mm -hmm. talking about that great story. So point is, they did learn to accept that, and it's not like they sat there keeping them up nights or anything. But point is, they it depends on who you ask. But in the meantime. They're touring with this. They go from openers to headliners, and they're they're playing a lot off it. They didn't play a song for love, which I was hoping for. I think eventually they did break it out. And eventually, I think on three sides, they brought a piano with them so they can knock out some of the torchier songs. But you've got, getting back to what we were talking about musically, musically, this is a funk rock album. There's yeah. no disputing that. Yep. But when you go off on the other kinds of their versatility really comes out is how eric was describing it and i agree 100 percent. you've got let me go down with little jack horn he's as funky as it gets yeah. when i'm president's pretty much a rap song with a, a rock back to it yeah. um then you've got we already talked more than words uh when i first kissed you that's sinatra he mentioned that's sinatra not, that's not a song. yeah that's a twerp song period and done very well. They're not doing this tongue in cheek they mean this and they're doing it excellently yeah song for love is as open a ballad as they come but it's not the more than words type ballad it's this lush soundscape of a, yeah a emotional crescendo for the album in my opinion yeah. so you know and then he man woman haters got that intro of flight of the wounded bumblebee which i've got in the liner notes as contributions from uh dweezil zappa i did not yes. know that until i started looking yes. at this i maybe well, known as a kid it, it all comes I, back to dweezil so yeah, yeah. but you know, it's funny that you mention all these styles and each song is so different. But then when you listen to the record, uh, somehow it works. It works that, seamlessly on the 25th anniversary release. They played it start to finish. I didn't know how start to finish it would work. And it worked yeah. beautifully. The yeah, on paper, it shouldn't work, but it works. Shouldn't. I mean, and it, it, does. Should, but it does. That crowd. Yeah. Okay. They're extreme fans. So, of course, they're going to love it. No, not necessarily. It works live in order from start to finish. The minute the rain sound started and the lights went down, 
yep. obviously opening song with deck in this dance people are going to lose it yep. but as they went the pacing actually worked i didn't think it would to be honest and i was up front i was on the that was the last show i was on the rail for and i do have a picture that i'll give to you to put up as a graphic but we did yeah. uh, my, friend, my friend eric and uh different eric and i uh epson did a meet and greet with the band so we did get to talk with to the band and i got to ask a question about something that'll come up in a little bit which is okay. going to be four three sides right. so after yeah. we talk for now we did before three sides yeah because when i listened to this record i wasn't all that familiar with it you know and i was listening to it and i just couldn't i just couldn't believe the how it flowed with all those different styles and and the way it worked because when this really came out back in the day i heard more than words i thought that was a nice song but i really i mean think about it fm radio they're not really playing a whole lot of this they're playing more than words and of course you know you've got pop radio that totally embraced it this is like one of those it's a night ranger thing either yeah. this is a blessing to the band or, a or it's a curse and, you, you and we right. determined with night ranger it was it's it was a, well on sea of tranquility when we talked about it it was definitely kind of both oh. do you think do you find that more than words was uh the same kind of thing they were pigeonholed, like Paul was was referring to, yeah. and they weren't the only band. Saigon Kick, they had Love Is On The Way, and that band is nothing like that song. It was just... It was but just, still, they made money. But more they than made the words money. Make, so. Mr. Mr. Big With To Be With You. So do you think after this record... Okay, we haven't got to the 1992 album, but there's a, you know, a break in between. I'm just asking you guys, do you think more than words hurt the band? Or did it help the band? I don't know. I think I, I want to know. I, what do you think? I, would think? I think go, Eric. You go first. I was going to say it, it without that song because that that song was being played on. There's a there was a radio station. Well, it still exists in Chicago. It's mm -hmm. it's a light light music. You know, they, that song was being played on that back. back well, back. easily could it could yeah. easily yeah. So I think it helped the band, in, in, in my opinion, to broaden their audience. And whether they go back and listen, oh, the rest is not for me. Mm -hmm. If if they listen to When I First Kissed You, wholehearted, hey, this band is a little bit more, um, quote unquote, smarter than the average band. You know, smarter might be a bad word, but no, uh, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. We're playing the lyrics. I agree. Smarter is a depth is an excellent yes. edge. There's wordplay going on in these lyrics. And again, the harmonies, I, I, I can't, here's where they, and that's where I, I blew it. I meant to say that. Here, they bring out their guns. They mm -hmm. they brought the harmonies up. Um, that, Like I said, that rhythm section now is not only tight, but you listen to this, oh, doesn't yeah. have to be a great system on a good system, and mm -hmm. it's going to be not just pumping, but clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. The production yeah. is great. And this is also the record that really took Nuno into guitar hero world. okay yeah. so what would before we get to the 1992 album because you know a lot can come into play in this era timings everything ladies and gentlemen as we've seen like look at skid row for one you know we're in 92 grunge has already happened okay and this came out in early 92 but anyway what would you rate the second record what would you give it what would you give it eric go ahead I, out of I, 10 I'm going 9.5. Okay. And the only reason I put 9.5, um, uh, what's the song? Jeez. Uh, Money, In God We Trust. I like that song a lot. Uh -huh. I don't love it like the rest of the album. So if, okay. if yeah, they have, and, and on this, this special disc that I've got, you know, they, I got this years ago. It's got the additional uh, bonus tracks. The only bummer part, the insert didn't come with it. But once you use it, you pay for that. Um but this has got, you know, the the remix of, of uh, More the Words, Nice Place to Visit is on here. Mm -hmm. um, get the Funk Out. Get the Funk Out. Uh, Pat Trevor sang uh, background vocals on that. Not guitar, but background well, vocals. Well, that's all right. I'll take that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I'll yeah, 9.5 for me. Absolutely. Perfect. Paul Simon, what you thought? what's your thoughts? Since we're talking B-sides real quick, Nice Place to Visit, their version of Hammer to Fall from Queen. Great song. Mm -hmm. And there's another one, Sex, or no, Sex, I'm sorry, not Nice Place to Visit. Sex and Love is the other B-side. Sex and Love is actually Hammer to Fall. If you listen to two of them together, definitely it's Hammer to Fall. Yeah, and that's why I didn't make the album. That's fine. It, it's That's fine. They're unabashed Queen fans, which 
stand by after I give my rating. Okay. But anytime, yeah, nine point for me actually for the exact same reasons. So I'll keep that short. It's a nine point five, and I do think Money is a a very good song, but it's a very good song. Um, it's it's the Prince Among Kings. Super. Well, it's interesting because now, obviously, the band is well. I would say improving, whatever. They're getting it together. Uh, the s- third album, Time out. Sides to ep- what? Uh oh. Before the third album came out, something happened with the band. Are we talking about a lineup change? No, I'm talking about April 20th, 1992, the Freddie Mercury tribute concert. All right. I was waiting for this. All right. This is why, when you brought up more than words, I held my tongue for a second. Okay. I do think they could have been pigeonholed. And depending on how record sales and grunge and all that stuff, I do believe that it, there was potential for them. It would have been a tragedy, but I think they could have gone the way of a lot of rock acts then. I do, I'm not going for the joke here, wholeheartedly believe that the reason they didn't is because of the imprimatur that Brian dropped, Brian May dropped on them on April 20th of 1992. Freddie Mercury tribute concert was a concert. 72,000 people in attendance at Wembley, 76 countries saw it televised, approximate viewing audience of 1 billion people. First half of the show was the bands who participated would come out, no queen, they would do three of their own songs, and then the second half of the show would be the three remaining members of Queen with either one member or various members of those bands doing queen songs. Okay. You chose something else. Extreme instead asked for if they could do this, Brian May said not only absolutely yes, the band said yes, but Brian May makes the first Queen member appearance of the day while everybody else has been playing their music, steps out, the crowd loses it at the sight of him. Mm-hmm. And he says, I want to introduce these guys possibly more than any other group on this planet, the people that understand exactly what Queen has been. Uh, these guys are real friends and possibly more than any group on this planet, the people that understand exactly what Queen has been about all these years and what Freddie was about all these years. Let's please give a warm welcome to Paul, Pat, Nuno, and Gary Extreme. They come out, they do a medley of Queen songs. Stop us, keep yourself alive, I want to break free, Fat Bottom Girls, Bicycle Race, Another One Bites the Dust, We Will Rock You, Bit of Stone Cold Crazy, and Radio Gaga. Jeez, my Watch, it's a, uh, 18 minutes, I think. Yeah. Watch that clip. That is when the world went, these are the more than words guys? Because you had, say there were fans of the band there, and there were also fan, people who had never heard of them, and people right. who knew them as words guys. They open, they're doing beautiful, perfect harmonies. Their playing is note perfect, but they're not mimicking Queen, they're paying homage to Queen. Right. They absolutely nail it. And watch the crowd when you watch that video because they're getting more and more into it. And by the time it's done, Gary is doing kind of the, the call and response thing with the crowd real quick before they break into uh, Radio Gaga. Yeah. And he actually has Patrick hold up. Badger, hold up. He start, uh, Pat hit the baseline and he goes, Patrick, hold on. And keeps the crowd going because they're so into it. Yeah. And then he goes, all right, people, Patrick. And then he hits the opening to Radio Gaga. The camera pans back. By the time they hit the course to Radio Gaga, you've got 72,000 people arms out doing the Radio Gaga thing. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. It's when I met the guys on the, the, at the meet and greet, I'm like, I have been dying to ask you this question. How did that feel? What was it like? Yeah. Gary's like, there's no explaining it. He goes, I don't remember his exact words, but he said, we're, we're never going to be, no one would be in a place like that again. It was a once in a lifetime. Right. That's moment. never going to happen again. No. Right. It was a once in a lifetime moment was what he was going for. Mm-hmm. But that was, I still get goosebumps even yeah. talking about it. It's because fantastic. It was that- Anybody who hasn't seen that, it's the absolute... It's biased. They stole the show. Well, no, that's not. That's hey, that's an honest opinion. That's good. That's a word. So that was April of ninety two. That's why I wanted to stop you before three sides talk started for September of ninety two. So I think they rode that wave Mm -hmm. and people discovered (laughs) who they were. Yeah. Cool. All right. So that was when was that again? What year? That April April twentieth of ninety two was only a couple months before three sides. September 14th of 92. Okay, because, yeah, this came out in September 92. 
Um, but this was the last album that featured the original lineup. Because mm-hmm. yeah. Paul Gary uh, later left and was replaced by uh, Mike Mangini. Mm-hmm. You want to go into artist management. Yep. That's fine. You know, people change. Uh, but this is yet, pe- you know, what I've read about it, this is yet another uh, concept record to some degree. How do you guys look at this record? Because, you know, a lot of times change. Musical landscape has changed since uh, the second record. Now we're in the grunge era. I know. Well, you know, a lot of bands didn't fare very well. Um, This record, well, I will say this. We brought Martin up before, but he gave this a 10 out of 10. Other... Other, other, uh, God, brain problem. So Martin gave this a 10 out of 10. All Music gave it a three. Entertainment Weekly gave it a B plus. Q gave it a three. It's kind of, I mean, I, for the most part, it got good reviews. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? I don't think this sold. This didn't sell at all. This was a failure. It only sold 700,000 copies compared to, you know, previous record that went double platinum do you think it was the musical landscape that uh so had something to do with it start paul or oh go ahead eric go ahead produced by nuno and bob st john who produced collective soul dockin duran duran he's engineered all three of their albums up to this point important to note Concept record again, concept in uh, more of a musical approach. Okay. Three sides. Yours is more of the hard rock. Uh, mine, more of that acoustic, and they bought in a little bit of the keyboards. And then the truth is progressive rock, you know, with the different arrangements, and they bought in the orchestra. Um, it's really not all that removed from pornography. Mm-hmm. However, um, the, the songs on this man I, it's interesting I I, I, re, I wanted to go on to read some reviews you, you're just mentioning grant here's some of the complaints go ahead I'll, re, I'll read some complaints and I'll read some uh compliments complaints self-indulgent and I'm thinking what musician and well what you know what you, I've heard that type of criticism yeah. with uh albums where you know like uh think about Queen Night at the Opera think about some of these albums that are yeah. loose concept records or concept records yeah. they always get that critique of being self-indulgent if you're doing a concept or oh, sure. a thematic thing so yeah i get that whatever uh, go ahead preachy uh, a tad too a tad too clever uh boring trying to do too much okay compliments brilliant experimental which is mm-hmm. true uh mature lyrically and musically somebody was paying attention there and introspective and inspired someone was really paying attention when they were listening to this record um yeah the the, some of the uh the songs that that and uh the lyrics that these guys get into on this record um man it's well i just got a few written down am i ever going to change this is i'm jumping ahead to well you're good you're fine uh, it's it's basically about a man who's tired of doing what he knows is wrong and wants to change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, God isn't dead. I mean, it's it's he said the, the writer and this this page Gary for all the he's he's looking at all the pain in the world and he search he's search for a loving God. Are you still there? Tragic comic, one of my favorites off this record. It's a, it's a roller coaster of a romantic connection with somebody. These are the themes that they were having on this record. It's, you know, it's, it's for me, when I first heard this, it was a grower of a record to me, but as time has gone on, I have learned to appreciate this and what they were doing was the general audience, especially after the Queen tribute and after, were they ready for this? In 1992, with Nevermind just released, with 10 by Pearl Jam just released, Bad Motor Finger by Soundgarden, were they really? No. Well, this kind of looks like one of those records that is a carryover from a different era. 
Yeah. And I think that's probably what the public saw. Yeah. But you would think with that Queen performance that this would just be a no brainer instant. I don't know. Yeah. But the you none of this makes sense to me. The record industry, the 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 record buying public, none of it, it yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. Technically, the way that this record should have been huge, but timing's everything. Yeah. Just go ahead, Paul. I know you're dying. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Go. Yeah. <laughs> just talk. We're just talking. It's, all right. So, <laughs> I was going to mention, <laughs> you know, I was, was going to mention, you know, we, the, uh, the lounge, the, the Sinatra lounge, you know, Gary Sharon, mm-hmm. seven Sundays on this record. He, he launches into that falsetto. It's fantastic. Ah, man. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> well, you know, I keep thinking the way you talk about Gary Sharon and speak so highly of him. I just wonder if that whole stint with Van Halen was, I, I don't know. You don't hear much about Gary Sharon after that. It's almost like, you know. Always David and Sammy. Y- yeah, but it's like. Do you think that stint with Van Halen hurt the way extreme is looked at nowadays? Uh, no. No, you don't think? No. You don't think that had any... Uh, you know, people Van Halen... look at the band and look at Van Halen individually. You know, Van Halen fans around. are so passionate and so polarized yes. that three is a footnote to them. Gotcha. It is. Okay. I don't think it hits the radar. I honestly don't. They're one of my fa- Van Halen's one of my favorite bands. I mean, I got... It's Eddie. They're one of my favorite bands the songs weren't just weren't that good on that record uh, and the yeah. production was terrible. Mm-hmm. So get, and like I was I, just throwing I it out there. That's yeah, and I, just mentioned, there. I mentioned at the top it, that, that album doing what it did had nothing to do with Gary. He sounds okay. fine on it. It's the material, the production, the material, there was many different things. So anyway, you know, this came out in the go. Well, Paul, go ahead. Say what you're going to uh, say. I think Eric and I are done. <laughs> You have the floor. Yeah, and if you're not, that's how we are. We play I these know. Listen. Well, that's the way we are in the warehouse. All right. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I was there at midnight for this release. Mm-hmm. I remember putting it on on my way home. I bought the cassette. The cassette had Don't Leave Me Alone. Yeah. The CD did not because they ran out of space. And Nuno even said in an interview, it felt like cutting his arm off. Mm-hmm. And I agree because if there's anything I would have done to this album, that is the song to not get rid of. I don't trust the date I found in my research, but I did find a demo version of it. So it is older than this album. I won't right. trust the year, but there is a demo version out there that's actually very interesting. Well, was there ever a like a CD single or anything? Yes, it was. It was actually a B side to two CD singles. Okay, they, gotcha. they pushed it when they realized they had to cut it from the album, and it actually closes side two. It closes mine. Mm-hmm. So, Eric touching the- right. Yeah, Eric touched on the theme of it with maturing and, and you know, struggle and all that in that process, existentialism even. I agree with everything you said and more so. So yours, I, I look at it, three sides of the story, I look at it as three albums. You've got yours, which is their funk side. Plus, it's not just, I don't want to say mindless because that's not fair to funk. It's not just about the groove. You've got songs like, okay, Warheads, anti-war song, makes a very strong statement. Rest mm-hmm. in peace, double meaning on that one. That was actually the lead single uh, in April of 92. Yeah. Uh, Blood of Calamity and Cupid's Dead. I'm jumping out of order real quick. Both great songs. Neither one of them grabbed me on the first list. And Cupid's Dead, they added a horn section when they toured with the horn section. And that actually did something for me. So that, like, that helped. Like, like they did with Gut the Funk Out. Yeah. Yeah. Color Me Blind. There's the harmonies. I mean, they're, they're present in all of this. But mm-hmm. then... And in Peacemaker Die, they get permission from the estate of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to use his I Have a Dream speech in here and a song that talks about how we take, to the Bill Hicks fans out there, to anybody who wants to change the world, we take these people and then we get rid of them. So very strong, strong statement for just this side. Then we get to mine. And that's where you get more introspective. And that's where you start doing your soul searching. Everything from relationships, Seven Sundays, Tragic Comic. Now we get to my actual favorite song on the album, which is Our Father. I'm not going to bother doing interpretations. Listen to it. Mm -hmm. From Our Father forward, I have listened to this album more times 
than I can count because I actually can divide this album into two mm-hmm. as opposed to three. It does. They're right. They got it. They're right. It's their album. I get where they're going with it, but I'm saying I like to split it in two because the truth actually as a precursor, if you listen to our father, stop the world, God isn't dead. Don't leave me alone are like a ramp that yep. takes you up to side three of the truth. Now with side three of the truth, you've got a suite in three parts. You've got, uh, the song is called Everything Under the Sun, and the songs are Rise and Shine, Am I Ever Going to Change, and Who Cares? 72-piece orchestra um, conducted by the arrangements or by Mike Moran. <coughs> Excuse me. Intro goes. You hear If you have headphones on, you'll hear this. There's a music box winding up, and it plays. And the sound for the technology they had in 1992, the sound starts spiraling up oh. and up. Yeah. And then they even released as a B-side um, an, an acoustic, which simply means they took percussion out of Rise and Shine. But Rise and Shine starts, and it's this big, opening, beautiful prog song. And then am I ever going to change? It, there's no some actually some versions of the CD actually didn't have a uh, uh, a tracks uh, track. What am I trying to say in the mastering process? Uh, yeah, it, they just went uh, one one two three. Right, everything was one. Everything under the sun was one song, as opposed to broken up into three on some. Oh, okay, gotcha. Chapter skip, chapter skip. So then, am I ever going to change? Things get dark. Now he's questioning his own existence, and then who cares? Everything kind of collapses in on our protagonist, and then that little voice reaching out. Just the symbolism is beautiful. It, and the orchestra comes in full. They did do the third side in Japan only with. Uh, all the way through and i wish they would have done it here and they didn't Mm. but then at the end of the song when it hits this gigantic beautiful crescendo everything goes back in the music box you can hear it close and then you can hear it winding down and it does that 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 oral that audio spiral back in and that's how the album ends i agree with martin you give it a 10 this is one of my five Desert Island albums, and this album came out in 90, 1992. It has never left my top five. So you said when you first heard it, though, it didn't grab you uh, initially, but I, I'm assuming after... It didn't grab him. It grabbed me. <laughs> it was me. It was... Okay. But Eric, yeah. it didn't grab you initially. But it, it was... Over- a- it was definitely a grower album for me. But Paul, you heard it and you just went, "Oh my!" Like the the heavens I parted, the, it's the waters never left parted. My top five of all, you totally it's got never it. Left my top five. No. Okay, wow. My, so you're so Paul, you're going to give that a, you're going to give it a ten out of ten. It is a ten. It is a ten. Eric, it's twice in a row I've agreed with Martin. That's a record. Well, yeah, so my, it's hard to agree with Martin on a lot of stuff, but that's this all right. is Everybody's one of those. In, yeah. Right. No, Go ahead, say, Eric. What were you going to say? This is one of those albums where, yes, th- this is their best album. Yes, this is a ten out of ten. Yes, this is my favorite album by them. There you go. This is their best well album. Said. Well said. Now you sound like Ryan Murphy. I agree. I listen. I, well, Presto you know, was Moving Pictures is their best record, ever. but. But Clockwork Angels is a ten, or, so you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my favorite record, but yeah. I do agree that Moving Pictures is the same kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, I listen to Pornography a lot more often than I do Three Sides. But Three Sides is when I'm in that mood, and I, yes, really I was going to say, hear it. Yeah, that's when you yeah. gotta have a, maybe a little bit of a mind, your frame of mind to listen to it. But boy, it's and the album you you hit it. Paul, it ends on such a great, it, it ends on a promise of a new day. Mm-hmm. And the way it just, oh man. Yeah. I, it, once once I got it, it, it clicked. And I'm like, oh man. It's a beautiful, beautiful album. Yeah. From start to finish. Damn. Can't beat that. 10 out of 10. Yeah. I did see that on some CD editions that everything under the sun or you do, but you, some you of them are to, just run as one. Some are indexed. I don't you know do have to have "Don't Leave Me Alone" on there. It is an absolutely crucial part of the. the I can't believe I'm actually going to sound this pretentious. Go ahead. It's a crucial part of the listening experience of this album. You have to have "Don't Leave Me Alone" on there. It I get it. So the sequencing on this record, the the, the track order, the way it is set up, is perfect. You can't. Yeah. It's 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 a it's a 
a work of art, so to speak. It as Sonically, you take the, the whole record as it is. Sounds good. I think John knows this band. He knows, and they know themselves with Nuno Co producing. They know how to sound like them. They, they get it right. Holy crap. Yeah. What else did Bob St. John do? I didn't you guys know? know? Eric? Yeah, he was uh Duran Duran. Well, I, and I don't know I don't know what albums. Oh. Uh Dokken, mm. Collective Soul. Those are some of the ones I, I had Duran Duran makes a lot of sense then because oh, yeah. he, he knows how to handle the low end of something. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, you've got that funk metal thing. I could see that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how he came into the project, but it sounds like to me he was a, a, an important part of it. So he's their Mutt Lang. If you want to talk Leopard for a minute, uh, ooh, he's their Mutt ooh. Lang. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, Achilles heel. So, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So we've got. Uh, well, oh, oh, so Eric, what did you? Were you going to give this a ten? Yeah, I gave it a ten. Ten out of ten for both. Jesus, God, you guys are wild. All right, excellent. Okay, so now we're in 1995. There is a span of three years between records. Waiting for the punchline. We're still in that grunge era, though. Although Kurt Cobain has passed away in 1994, the musical landscape, for the most part, is still. I still say it's we're in the grunge era, but the musical landscape is constantly changing. How do you look at this record? How does this fit in with 1995? Um, how does this record fare with the records that came before? Eric, what's your thoughts on this record? So, yeah, again, uh, produced by Bob St. John and Nuno. Um, and Grant, again, you start you started off well. We are, now 1995, we're like almost in that transition from grunge to alternative music. So... Well and put, their, yes. And this is their first album. Let, let me grab my prop. This is their first album with Mike Mangini on drums. Well, I wrote Mike down, Mangini. so 1995, I wrote down some albums that were released in 1995, popular ones. Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Mel, Grant, help me out with that. Mel Melancholy and Mel Infinite Sadness. Sadness. Yep. I love uh, that record. Uh, well, uh, I, I wanna, I'm going to go on a, a tangent real quick. When uh, that came out, that was my album of the year. It got kind of got mixed reviews, but when I heard that record, I thought absolutely brilliant. I pl must have played that for months, and I still like it. I think it's a brilliant record, and it's probably one of the best albums of the year. Anyway, I just had to say that. I'd yeah. like to do like a Ma Smashing Pumpkin yeah. show or something because yeah, I think I mean, the Pumpkins some brilliant stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. Anyway. Well, it's, it's Illinois. What do you expect? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But yeah, and that fits right in with what the next album, Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill, the first Foo Fighters record, DC Talk, Jesus Freak. Mm -hmm. That was a big album for them. Hootie and the Blowfish, Crack Review, Oasis, Wonderwall. And everything has uh, changed. Extreme, Eric, and everything has changed from when Extreme started out. Look at the landscape. Totally different now. Totally different. So, right. And, and me per and personally, not to make this, uh, this is all about Eric, where I was what? listening to music in 1995, I was kind of going, I was still listening to all the bands I loved. Um, oh, real, real quick, I wanted to mention they're contemporaries. And when I mean contemporaries that people pigeonhole them with, mm -hmm. here are their albums that were released in 1995. Lawrence, Ultra, Phobic, Dokken, Dysfunctional. Saigon Kick, Devil in the Details, great album. Mm -hmm. And Skid Row, Subhuman Race, which probably out of all these was probably the one that got the most exposure. But what was the theme with all them? All those bands, quote unquote, went grunge. I don't, when I, and I heard all those albums. Mm -hmm. The Saigon Kick is a different animal altogether, but I don't hear it on the Warren album. I, I really don't hear it. It's di they're different, but grunge alternative, I don't hear it. When I when this first came out, I listened to it a couple times because I, extreme at that point. I'm like, oh, extreme. You know, I, I was I was still listening to this and pornography in the first one. I didn't really have any preconceived notions what this was going to sound like. I'm like, oh, it's great. It's it's a band. Mike Mangini, new drummer. Let's let's go. So I can look back and I can respect uh, and enjoy this album. Um, but at that time. 
when this, like I said, I was still listening, I was taking a deep dive at that time in the early mid nineties into someone opened up a door for me mm-hmm. with Christian rock and Christian metal bands, which I had outside of Striper and Petra, I had no idea. And yeah, some of those bands are a little contrived. You know, you got White Cross that sound like Warrant and you got X Center. They sound like ACDC, but there's some gems and there's a lot of talent in those. That's what I was kind of listening to. And then this band comes out with this one and I didn't hear grunge. I didn't hear alternative. I go, this sounds like extreme. And I'm sure Paul's going to hit on it. The production on this is what brings this album down. It's well, it sucks. Well, it's a lot more raw sounding. I'll give you that. Um, But I think that's probably why people think that things sound more grunge, because I think a lot of it was a little bit more, and I, I don't want to say accessible, but raw. I guess raw. You know? it's, it makes it sound like it's it, the production to me makes it sound kind of like um, gloomy. Like there's no, if there's what if I have a knock on this album, it's there's like where's the energy? Well, it looks like you say gloomy. It kind of looks like the album cover reflects that. Yeah. Which is I mean, looks like they got, like, got clown here in the back. They got like a from a carousel horses or something. Yeah, like, it's weird. Uh, which well, is yes, a very product of its time looking, but I don't think the album sounds like that. That's just me. So I'll you don't you different. don't dig this record too much? Oh, I like it. But I, I think I think the songwriting is still there. Lyrically, again, mm-hmm. really strong. Um the, the guitar work, the band sounds great. Okay. It's just the production you don't no, like. No, Going back to those albums I had mentioned, mm-hmm. Smashing Pumpkins and Oasis, the first Foo Fighters record, this was lost in the shuffle. So it really didn't stand out. It no. kind of just got, it just yeah. blended in. I Do you think back... that this record, they lose some of their uniqueness then? They don't, you said they don't stand out, but I mean, what made Extreme so great before was that lost on this record. I know you can still have good songwriting. Blah, blah, blah. Nuno can still play. Gary can still sing. But something's happened. They're trying to fit in with the times a little bit, maybe. Instead of doing... Okay, so it's kind of the KISS phenomena, where KISS yeah. used to be leaders. You know, in the grunge era, a yeah. lot of these bands didn't know what to do. KISS became followers. So yeah. do you think Extreme, instead of being passionate to what they were doing before with all these changes, and then if you have records that fail... You start questioning yourself. Are we doing the right thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. This could be, I don't know. I don't know if there's a book on extreme, but I'm just thinking if you had a great hit, you know, uh, no, there's some, the second I, record, big hit. The third record doesn't take off. You're sitting there on this fourth one. You're taking time in between. You're really thinking, what am I going to do? Or what are we going to do? I mean, this is what they came out with, but I, I you know, like I said, they're I, followers instead of going with their passions. I, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, you know, I, I, I still say the songwriting is there. I mean, there is no God, which is not what the song title is all about. Cynical's great. Uh, Midnight Express, a nice little acoustic. I, again, Nuno shining again here. You got uh, no respect. Shadow boxing is again. The songs are there, Paul. You may think different here, but. I Paul just sits there and smiles. I, I, I can appreciate this going back because I went back. It was one, once I heard their last album that came out. Or not, yeah. Not six, but saw. How do you say that? Bugazi Rock. Thank you. Right before well, that, I, I went back and listened to this and I'm just like, you know, this isn't. It's good. I, I, I like this record. Not like I do like the other three, but there's some strong stuff on here to me. That's it just sounds a little different. Just like when Warrant and Dokken did their thing, they're just trying to stay relevant in a grant. You hit it right in a landscape of music that is just constantly changing, especially in 1995. Mm-hmm. Here. But this, they must have only had a, th- a four album deal because they disbanded after this because yeah. this didn't sell. This didn't do anything either. I remember back in the day seeing this used quite a bit. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. But it is what it is. But now you never see it. In fact, I never see any extreme in the bins anymore. And this you'd never see anymore. Back in the day, you used to see it. 
gone. But the reviews on this, I just want to say, All Music gave it two stars. Martin Popoff gave it a seven. We're slipping. We're slipping a bit. And then Daily Vault Entertainment Weekly gave it a B minus. So it's kind of mixed, mixed, you know. And we do have Paul Gary on some tracks. Mike Mangini was on like yeah. three songs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, Mike uh, played it on uh, Hip Today, Leave Me Alone and No Respect. Yeah. Paul played on the rest of the album. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did this chart? Let me look. Uh, it got to 40 on the Billboard 200. Fared better in the UK. Um, because of unconditionally being a single over there, I think. Could be. But here it really didn't do. 40 is not a good, good showing, you know? Uh, well, yeah, that's not good because the previous record, Extreme 3, got up to number 10. Even though it didn't sell, it's probably those orders, you know, it did yeah. get up to 10. I wouldn't say it's a failure. It didn't sell like the second album, but the, the fourth album definitely was a bomb. I could see where they would break up. Well, Nuno wanted to go solo and... Gary, you know, he joined Van Halen. It's but, Sonic, uh, Tribe of Judah. Yeah. Yeah. Other stuff. yeah. It just seems like they, I could see where they would break up. It just doesn't seem like anything is going to go well for them. You know what I mean? I don't <laughs> mean that, oh. but it's just timings has a lot to do with it. So I'm going to ask you what would, well, let's go over to Paul and get his thoughts and then we'll get a rating. Okay, Paul, what's so, your thoughts on this record compared to everything else? You were on you you were on a roll when you were saying what do they do? Their passion project, their what's put it on the line. This is the this is the album we wanted to make with three sides comes out and it doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. And they do the tour they want to do. And they they sold out the venues they they played at, but they were still playing like, like in Chicago. It was the Riviera and it was, you know, the hard rock. And mm -hmm. but their their bubble is shrinking a little bit. And then everything you guys both said as far as the times. So if they were going to pander and they were going to be followers, they would have done another more than words. And they didn't. Good point. It it's they didn't follow and the they, Night Ranger scenario, which they did Sentimental Street. So no, they didn't. What they did do was they followed that theme, and now, beyond maturing, now we're in old person cynicism level. Let's get angry at everybody. Opening song, There Is No God. First single off the album is Cynical, but once you open it up in the liner notes, it's actually called Cynical. So, that was the first single. I, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there. Do you think <laughs> There Is No God? you think that's a good way to lead off the record? <laughs> that's my, I'm getting there. Yeah. Then, Tell oh. me something I don't know. We're actually so cynical them. as fuck on the liner notes. Cynical fuck. Yeah. Then, third <laughs> song, Tell Me Something I Don't Know, which killed live, echoing through the whole place. Tell me something, something I don't already know. He's, Gary's preaching now. Yeah. If today's the second single, there has not been a more autobiographical song. No, and, and I don't believe they meant it that way before. That gets oh. taken wrong. But hip today, you'll be gone tomorrow. They're, they're not well, making a statement about themselves, by the way. They're not. But they are saying that you that could interpret it that way, though. Now, I know. Yeah. Midnight Express. They've been playing Midnight. It was called Midnight initially. They've been playing that. Nuno been playing that as his part of his solo live for years. It finally made it to the album. So fans were like, finally, we get Midnight. Uh, at the said meet and greet, he actually played that for sound check. We all lost our minds. Um, Leave Me Alone, one of the strongest songs on the album by easily. Yes. No respect, a little bit too. Now we're getting into the funk, almost rap territory again. Um, Evil Angelist, Shadow Boxing, not as memorable for me personally. Mm -hmm. Unconditional is now we're back in ballad territory, but it's their version, and that's fine. It unconditionally reminds me a lot of Song for Love in that. When they do ballads, they don't do soapy, ridiculous, stereotypical ballads. There's always some. There's right. meat and potatoes there. There's definitely right. a spiritual right. side to it. There's yeah. it, it, thinking. For, thank you for that one. You're right, Eric. It's a thinking person's ballad. Unconditionally, is a beautiful song. I learned something not included in the U.S. release is "Fair Weather Faith." I've never heard that song because I what didn't. Did, what was that on? Was that like yeah, on the Japanese yeah. import or what? Yeah. Yes. Japanese makes sense. Yeah. So I, I have some homework to do. Wow. And then wait for the punchline is the hidden track after unconditionally on the U.S. release. Yeah. Yeah. So that being said, the mix 
always the most important thing in the world to me, the sound. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah. all the praise I was heaping on this as far as that well-rounded, it's got the great low end, it's got that, you know, you take any two players and they're in perfect sync and all that, and you've got, no, no, no. They just decide to light that on fire. Um, the, the playing and the raw talent is just as hot as it's ever. The, the, the writing is fantastic, but they made production decisions that I simply, I'll say, I don't agree with. And I do believe they were they were whether it whether they were evolving or following the sign of the times is not for me to say. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I do think that they did what they wanted to, as opposed to following. Because I said if they wanted to, okay, we need to get back to this. They had to put more than words two out. I don't. I don't believe they were following. What I do believe is that they said at this point, you know what, we're angry and we're going to make this album that we want to make, and it's dark, and it, the whole album is cynical as hell. But that being said, at least they made the album they wanted to, I think. Mm -hmm. That being said, it is too dry for my tastes, sound-wise, the mix-wise. It is too dry for me. It's Raw is a good word, but there's a, it's got a good chunk to it, in like a hard edge to the sound, but there's the warmth is gone. And that that is an ingredient that their music needs. And it came back. We're not going to do. We're not going to go into them. But the 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 single off so Dodge Day Rock was Ghost when they got back together. That, in my opinion, only until Six came out was the best song they wrote after Three Sides to Every Story. It it absolutely slays anything on Punchline, and it's the best song on so Dodge Day Rock by far. I think Ghost is. If you want to get back to extreme after Three Sides, go to Ghost. And I'm not saying skip this album because it's not good. I'm saying if you want that extreme and you long for that, they come back with Ghost as a single. But yeah. sticking back with Punchline, um, yeah, it's I, I I like it and I admire it. I can't say I always enjoy it, but that's a personal taste thing. That's not a criticism of the album itself. I was going to say, Paul, it's maybe not as energetic as other albums, but it's also not the departure that folks think it is. Agreed. Very well said. Agreed. I mean, this record has Bob St. John co-producing on this yeah. with uh, yeah. Nuno. I mean... They wanted it to sound like this, and that's that's their call. I, I this is I, They made the album they wanted to make, and it's the talent is there, the playing is there. Huh. I miss certain aspects of their sound, but that's... Notice I. I put I in there. That's I a wonder, personal... Yeah. I wonder how this band... I mean, do you guys... You know, we've talked about Night Ranger before and how the record company said, you know what? Boy, that sentimental street was a big hit. We need uh we need another hit. Did the extreme doesn't seem to have that. You would think that more than words, they would, would want another player. one. Huh? Yeah, un unconditionally would have been the the US single if they were trying to do that. Or even they would have given they would have pulled a rush, not well, not the band, but as far as the record company releasing um oh God help me with this, uh giving uh the instrumental to the college rock stations. Mm -hmm. which album why am i blanking on this leave that thing alone from counterparts oh yeah okay. they sent that out that was a gutsy move they could have done that with midnight express and done the same thing mm -hmm. they didn't unconditionally was not a single in the u.s so no they didn't they didn't take that easy route they stuck to their guns in my opinion so no right. that's cool. they did what they wanted to do well that means a lot i mean if this is the album that they meant to make then i'm totally down with it yeah. but, you know <clears throat> You just wonder, you know, as things go and things don't sell, record companies going, boy, we'd like to have a hit here, you know? Oh, yeah. All right. So, Eric, what would you rate this? I'm going 6.5. Ooh. But, again, I, I, That's pretty I, don't, well. I don't go back to it often, but, you know, the songs that I do like on here, I, I really like a lot. You know, the ones that I kind of mentioned, but okay it's yeah fair. it's just the production you know like we both talked about just <sighs> well let me ask you this let's say you didn't know the band extreme and this was your gateway drug would you look at this record differently how does it stand like if this was a first album from these guys still the same would you look at it the same way it, it, to me it would come across like a collective soul record okay or Trying to think of other things that were, you know, Silver Chair, I think, had an album out in 94, 95. <laughs> Silver Chair. Yeah. yeah. What was <laughs> the song that they did? Oh, oh my um, God. Yeah. 
<laughs> God, I remember that. They used to play that all the time. Yeah. Candle, bo- candle Box. Yeah. But I think they were a little earlier than that. But yeah, that, it's along those lines. Um, yeah. I, I, it I, just yeah. sounds like to me, this just isn't the extreme that you want. Lyrically, yes. Mm-hmm. Approach, yes. Mm-hmm. Playing, yes. Sound-wise, production, Thank no. Yes. Okay. So, 6.5? Paul, what's your rating? I'm going to go slightly higher because of different elements. If you, look, I look at cynical for a minute, and I, I almost have to laugh because I, I've gushed so much about their harmonies and the way they all play together. And any band that could take a song like Cynical, which is a great song, mm-hmm. but have such sweet, beautiful harmonies with no effect whatsoever. So there's that dry sound and going cynical and then having all four of them going, fuck, is hysterical to me. <laughs> it's, oh, there's it's a number of moments, yeah. Yeah, that it's, gets extra it, points. <laughs> it does. It does. Hip Today is actually, ironically, a very hip song. It's catchy. It, the writing is absolutely still here. The The energy is absolutely there. I'm personally not wild about the direction they took that energy with, but all the elements are still there. So for me, it's mostly the, the final mix I'm not as wild about. So I'm going to give this, I'd say, a 7.5 or an 8. I keep bouncing back and wow. forth. Oh, that's pretty good. It's a strong album, but the thing is, I personally, every time the word personally jumps in, I keep thinking, who the hell am I? I'm one listener. I'm not a pro, so it's yeah. But I can knock all okay, valid. Personal <laughs> preference: I can knock four songs off this album, and I call it a nine. Oh, my! Mine would go up too. My rating would go up. Yeah. There's four songs. I'm not even going to bother naming them. Oh, but no. Not ones I've mentioned over and over well, again. Think about it. It's this is in that period. This came out, you know, 1995. I, was, I heard it in a rush by then. So this went, is way too cynical for me. Think about <laughs> it, though, Paul. You might be onto something because this album is 65 minutes long. That's a lot of slogging through cynical, upset, angry, yeah. dry sounding. <laughs> So Talent. maybe if it was it's, edited, trimmed down some, it would have made a stronger record. I think so it was like there's filler on here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Songs are a little longer than what they need to be. O- opinion. It's a lot of long. There's no God, six yeah. minutes. Tell me something I yeah. don't know. 625. Naked's 546. Yeah. It's a long record. Waiting for the punchline, six minutes. Unconditionally, it's five minutes. There are no, you know, what the... The, 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 the shortest song is... 358, 351. In no respect or midnight. No respect, yeah. 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 And that's Which, not to say that these... Midnight Express is beautiful. Don't. Holy cow. You, people talk about Play With Me and Flight of the Wounded Bumblebee yeah. as like, that's a Nuno solo. I'm sorry, you give me Midnight Express any day of the week. That yeah. Oh, yeah. That sound, and it, watching him play it, I took video of him playing it. Mm-hmm. You can't see his hand. It's Hummingbird. It's hysterical. It's blurry. Even in today's technology, it's awesome. Midnight Express is 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 easily the high point for me on this album, just because it's so unbelievably good. Yeah, and I'm not saying that the rest is bad. I told you, I, 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 I I'm gonna settle on my eight. It's a it's a very very good album. I just don't like the sound that they ended up wanting for this album. And that's why that's, that's why a pretty I- strong statement for an album you don't like the way it sounds though because i would think you would give it you know there, there's so score. there's so much talent on this album is why i can't gotcha. go lower. okay the harmonies are still absolutely note perfect the playing they're in sync together they're still oh they're so tight it's like no i can't go lower than that okay. they're just talented yeah you know, I mentioned about the uh, the complaints on the three sides, you know, like they're trying to do too much. And that's probably another, besides the production, um, maybe that's why I have it at 6.5. It just kind of yeah. comes across like they're trying to just do too much here. But again, the, the stuff that I, I said it for, I'll say it again, the stuff that the, the songs I I love, I love on this record. The other ones, eh. All right. Hey, you got to be honest in this. So that's all that matters. Um. I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, I'm looking, 
because I'm not. Well, there's a couple of compilation albums that came out. Would you recommend? What would you recommend? I see. Oh, there's no. one that came out in '98, The Best of Extreme. <laughs> Forget that. If you're going to get into this band, just dive in, get the right. Uh, <laughs> right. Or, you know, check out some of the demos that it's, that's on, uh, you can find it on stream, streaming. Uh, there's some really good uh, demos out there that, man, they have potential to be on some of those, these early, these early albums. Mm -hmm. Nice. Just a few that I, that stuck out to me. Uh, Touch You, uh, nice place to visit. Sex and Love is actually a, a B-side. Uh, it Won't Be Long um don't let him uh fall for you which is actually i think i think rick springfield did that song too if i'm not mistaken and recently uh paul uh he uh texted me this morning about that interview with um on that canadian show there's a live song there's a live uh shot of them in concert doing a song we think it's called mr fate no, it's Mr. No, it's Mr. I found it. I did some digging. After you did? You. Okay. It's it belonged on the first album. It was actually called Mr. Bates and it's a masturbate joke. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, oh, my. Oh, my God. Great song, though. Yeah. Great yeah. Song. And because it's Christmas time, I want I, you know. good catch. Go ahead, please. I very special, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the the discs uh very special christmas geez they, they're probably on number what 30 something now probably extreme song christmas time again one of my favorite christmas songs absolutely check it out it's awesome cool all right cool well wow this is bands kind of like on a like a bell curve they kind of well, they only had, we're just looking at the A&M album, so it's just kind of like this, and then they go down. But not a big, dramatic drop, you know. Sly and the Family Stone, you look at them, they were the same kind of thing. They started out slow, but they had a lot of records. Oh, yeah. And it took a long time for them to really come down. Extreme's a very short, you yeah. know. But uh, if anybody's going to get into them, I'm assuming get Extreme 3 or and get Extreme 2. That's what you want to start out with, too. Start with two seat and go to three. Okay. Yeah. And then if and you want to just have a good old fun time with a rock record, go to the debut. All right. And as, a, and as a side note, make sure you pick up Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure soundtrack because not only is Play With Me on there, but a bunch of other fantastic songs, including Two Heads Are Better Than One from Power Tool, otherwise known as Nelson, but they couldn't call themselves Nelson because of their record contract. No, well, I so, did not know that. It's one of the Both underrated people. gem soundtracks of the 80s. Oh, Robbie Rob, Big Pig. Oh, man. Beautiful album. Outstanding. Pick. I don't think I've ever heard it. Oh, what's the I one? I've always cost you money. Walk, this one cost me today. Walk <laughs> Away by Bricklin. All right. In time from Robbie Rob. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, there you have it. The extreme A and M years, like I said, they put out a couple albums later, but we were just concentrating on those A and M records. Or if we if we didn't, we'd be here all night. Anyway, so we can recommend Extreme Two and Three. Start out with Extreme Two. You know, it's got the hits. God, there's like five singles released off of it. So check that out. That's the peak. Um, and if you dig that, branch out see what you like and hey if you do like these records we do want to hear from you in the comments what are your what's your thoughts on these AM records from extreme there you go we want to hear from you um in the meantime please like subscribe and, and God, there's going to be more great content but uh, i'm going to thank eric and uh, oh there we go i want to <laughs> i want to thank yes. eric and Paul for coming on tonight and talking extreme. It's been a fun conversation. No, it's doing it again. Um, I don't know. Check it out. Pick up some extreme. Report back and let us know what you think. Gentlemen, you have anything to add before we wrap it up? I guess we're Remember, covered. Here, check out that Queen medley. Yes. Oh yeah, the Queen medley. That's probably on YouTube too, right? That's must view. All right. That's check out the Queen medley. Fan. Pick up some extreme and let us know. All right, boys. Well, it's been fun. Love talking music with you, gentlemen. You brother. All yes. right. Until the next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Like, please like, subscribe. All right. Bye.